uh, let's start. Let's start. I mean, as you, you all know from the announcements, that the, the topic today is the rising populism in Europe and its impact on immigrants. And most of us are one way or the other immigrants. Actually, all of us are immigrants. Doesn't oh, matter oh, where we come oh, from and where we live. Uh, so this, uh, I, don't, I have to use this. Yeah, yeah work without this? video. Oh, okay. Yeah. <coughs> so, uh, so this is our our topic today. Uh, it just made a collage of some some visuals, and I think it kind of pretty summarizes the the entire subject very well. If you take left and top the picture, these are the lady and the gentleman uh, responsible for, largely these days, responsible for populism in Europe. And the impact of their policies you can see in the other six or five uh, photographs, uh, what's happening to the world because of their policies and how they are misused. First they create a chaos of migration and then they use it in their political benefit. So it's, uh, that's, the, that's the equation. But before we go into the topic, as usual, I'd just like to quickly take you through uh, a brief introduction of OPP. OPP is a platform for the people of uh, Pakistani origin, that could be any origin in fact, to promote progressive values in a multicultural environment. environment. <clears throat> what our vision is, it's uh, unity and diversity because we live in an increasingly diverse world and uh, unity is becoming every day more and more important. What our mission statement is to strive to eliminate exploitation and discrimination through meaningful dialogues. So not any kind of unmeaningful dialogues or uncivilized dialogues like we were talking about <laughs> earlier, but uh, really meaningful dialogues. Dialogues which get us somewhere and not just uh, keep on going in circles. A very, very brief overview of the programs we have done, events uh, so far. Uh, we were founded uh, yeah, in the end of 2016. Uh, our first really big event was bridging the generation gap, then Pakistan in search of identity, uh, and Pakistanis in the Netherlands, their identities and expectations, and the contradictory choices, minorities in Pakistan, and Pakistan as minorities in Europe or elsewhere. Then NGOs in Pakistan, we had our annual meeting, uh, enforced disappearances, integration of Pakistani women in that society, uh, freedom of media, we had this uh, discussion, and then on uh, uh, dilemma or an opportunity, challenges for the Dutch Pakistani youth in how they reconcile the two opposing cultures and opposing sets of values sometimes. Then <coughs> democracy and religion, are they mutually exclusive? <coughs> Then our again a review meeting, then human rights struggle in Pakistan, and now today the rise in populism in Europe and its uh, implications on, uh, on immigrants. Let me take you briefly through this uh, subject, which we I talked about earlier, so back to that after our introduction. I start with a quote from uh, Anthony Daniels. Truth is not the first casualty of war alone. It is the first casualty of populism, and probably uh, very, very true, because when you look at the, all the populist statements, their strategies, their communication, you will see that the first truth really is, and now NEP, NEP news and, uh, or fake news is, the, is really an officially recognized uh, terminology, which everyone is proud of, actually. <laughs> it's, uh, it has become part of the mainstream politics and mainstream media politics. Uh, <clears throat> and another quote from Huntington, uh, that was about uh, the populism, but this one about migration in its broadest aspect is a record of man's migrations from one environment to the other. So migration actually, refuge or migration, is as old as human beings. It's, it's nothing like suddenly migration appeared out of nowhere and people started moving from one region, one province or one <coughs> continent to another, this has been actually the history of mankind. And if you look at some 1.75 1, 1. million, one and a half to one and three quarters of a million years of large migrations which took place around the world in, in absolute numbers, and this is the reconstruction of, uh, so again, this has been something going on. Now, what are the key drivers of populism? Because as I said, populism and migration both are very old. Populism is also a very old phenomenon because 
whether they were kings or lords or knights, they used to make populist statements to be popular. Uh, so what are really the key drivers? And I will just very quickly summarize them and then uh, ask our speakers to, uh, to take on. Uh, the rise of populism is the most important European political development of this century. I mean, we can really say that there hasn't been any political movement internationally, or, or at least in, in, in the Western world, which has been so big and so huge, and which has made so much impact on the entire society, entire economy, entire politics, relationships between the nations, between the countries, between the governments, between the people. It had a huge impact on every single aspect of life. So how, what are the key drivers? What is really making it tick and making it move? First and I think foremost is the economic recession. Okay, recessions are also a periodic phenomenon. We see that economic recessions happen every so many years. But the last one has been probably the longest one. It started in 2008, and it is still not ended. We actually officially, in many countries, we live in rece uh, recession. And it's a kind of become an ongoing thing. So if recession is short, and after two, three years it's over, people start thinking positively, there's a positive energy, you see the upswing in the economy and the lifestyle and the uh, standard of living. But this one has, has been sustained so long that people get really, really worried then. Is it ever going to end? It's having, it's having impact now not only on me, my children, my grandchildren, and everything I did uh, my entire life, this is now taking its toll. So that is a huge motivator to be vulnerable and to start uh, falling victim to, to the populist slogans. One very, very big and probably the most important in the entire list is the ne neoliberalism uh, 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 backlash, as I call it. Now, if we look at the neoliberalism, and that's the only point I will, I will uh, dwell on for, for two minutes. I mean, if many of you might remember uh, Milton Friedman, the American economist, the Reagan Reaganomics uh, uh, advocate. He and his so-called Chicago boys in Chile, in, in America, in Russia, in Eastern Europe, this, they really sucked all these countries and the huge wave of privatization under Reagan and under Margaret Thatcher, the formation of huge multinationals and the, the tax freedom which was given to them and the multinationals which became in fact in themselves so big. I mean if you look now at uh, uh, some of the multinationals, their consolidated value is higher than the total budget of GN GDP of many countries. So th it, it, it gave birth to, and they took slowly the responsibilities of the governments on, because the, the, the massive privatization of gas, water, healthcare, transport, everything which governments used to run, and it was like a service to the people, they managed to privatize and take it uh, from the government, and government became very weak in that sense, and we all became dependent on those multinationals, even for very basic and essential services. So they can rein us in whenever they want, they can increase the prices whenever they want, so basically they had total control on us. So this, had, this, this thing had a really a huge impact uh, on... Uh, uh, okay. uh, huge impact on the thinking of the people and uh, on the entire economy. Uh, the, the banks, as we know, we had this uh, crisis, as I said, 2008. The big banks fell. A lot of banks were kind of uh, bailed out, too big to fail, kind of uh, George Bush's theory. The militaries and the wars have been privatized. Even if you look at the first and second Iraq, uh, Af Afghanistan and Iraq war, it was basically 50% of the people present on ground fighting the war, they were consultants from private companies, so-called consultants. Blackwater is one of the very famous ones. So everything was privatized in that sense, uh, and it left a huge impact on, on economy, on politics, and on the people. And that led to actually loss of trust in mainstream politics, because they were saying something else, doing something else. They were, the whole neoliberalism, they promised big generation of wealth, which it, it, it created a lot of wealth, but 90% to 98% of the wealth created went to the top 2%. And the remaining 2%, yeah, wealth, 
they, that went to the other 10% of the population. So the disbalance of distribution of wealth, it was so big that the gap between rich and poor, despite creation of a lot of new wealth, that the gap kept on increasing. And, and therefore, all those promises, uh, they were broken, they were never fulfilled. And that led to a loss of, in mainstream politics. And that's what actually the multinational companies wanted, uh, the capital system wanted, that you lose faith in all institutions and in all governments, and you become dependent on us uh, as much as possible. Distrust of the elite was uh, corruption. We see now corruption actually is, is prevailing more in right-wing extremists. If you look at uh, Pim for Town or uh, Forum uh, for Democracy or all these parties, you have right, left, center corruption, people taking money, running away, charged for scandals, aggressive behavior, drunken behavior, beating their wives and you name it and mistreating their neighbors and you have these things in the press actually uh, every other day so and plus the, the very high level corruption uh, that uh, was ultimate result because if one very small elite consolidates all the power and wealth yeah that starts corruption by itself and that led again as i said legitimacy of transnational institutions there were huge institutions, trade blocks and corporations, uh, institutions, they started losing their credibility. Yeah, then comes Donald Trump. <laughs> That's the icing on the cake, if you wish. And uh, he provided a kind of umbrella and leadership to all these emerging uh, right uh, extremists and populist uh, people, leaderships and governments. If you look at, as we said in our advertisement, uh, uh, Steve Bannon, who was his strate strategist, he has moved to Europe. He has bought an old church uh, in, uh, not a church, what do you call it? A monastery. Monastery, a monastery yeah. thank you. A monastery in Italy. And he's starting the first uh, right-wing university there, where the future leaders, right-wing extremist uh, politicians will be trained and educated and generated. And he has raised a lot of funds to unite the right-wing extremist populists of Europe and create a united front. Mm -hmm. And you see that in the European elections which are happening like now, today, as we speak, as we sit here. Mm -hmm. There is a united right-wing front for the first time. And they were expecting to become the third largest bloc in, un in the European Union. So that's how this whole movement, because of Trump, became a very organized movement. Because one nature of these people is like uh, that they are in themselves, closed borders, in an isolation. But now they, they are united for some kinds of causes. And uh, he wants to break Europe, basically. That's what Steve, uh, uh, his mission is and Trump's mission is. And of course, we are to blame as well. Lack of counter movement by centrists and the left. We couldn't politically create a narrative which really counters uh, the rise of uh, populism. The second third generation of the guest workers claiming their place, that also led to some kind of backlash because when our parents or grandparents came here, or Moroccans, Turks, doesn't matter when I say our, it includes everyone. They came here, they were called Hastarbeiter, guest workers, which literally means you are a guest and you are a worker. And when your work is done, we will say, please, your host is asking you to leave and you leave. So guest is a guest. Whenever you want them to leave, they leave. So that was, and everyone accepted it, all the entire population. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. They are coming in so many numbers. They are doing this, they are doing that. But that's okay because they are guests and they can leave whenever we want them to leave. When we don't need them, we will ask them to pack up and go. But their second and third generation, they said, hey, 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 I am born here, I'm raised here, I'm educated here, I'm married here, I don't speak my mother tongue, I've never been to my own country, this is my culture, this is my country, I belong here, and I have equal rights like everyone else. And then suddenly it was, wow, he's claiming equal rights. Now, he's not guest worker anymore, and then the backlash starts and the new kind of conflict uh, suddenly emerges. Uh, then media, social media, you guys all know about it, uh, how, what kind of role media and social media has, has played, how Facebook has been used to manipulate certain elections, uh, and so on and so forth. Mismanaged refugee crisis and immigration, all those wars which happened recently started, again, by, supported by these populists, in the Middle East in particular. I mean, look at Iraq, look at Afghanistan, look at Libya, look at Tunisia, look at Yemen, look at Sudan. I mean, every, look at Egypt, every single place 
uh, they created the flow of refugees and then mismanaged the, the, their immigration. If you look at uh, Lesbos in Greece, the camps there, thousands and thousands of people are stranded, nothing to eat, nothing to drink, no toilets, no thing. I mean, it's a, and we kept them, Western Europe very cleverly managed to keep, I mean, out of sight, out of mind. If you look at <laughs> pay Turkey $5 billion and say, keep the nonsense there, we don't want to see them, pay them off. And all these kinds of policies, which totally, look at Italy, uh, Lampedusa, uh, how many boats were coming, how many thousands were dying in the boats, but nobody cared, because if you don't see them, yeah. it's okay. What is in the media, and this is where, again, media was corrupted and, uh, and actually influenced not to publish certain things and to publish certain things which go in their favor. So this was a complete mismanagement for refugee crisis and the immigration. So what in it led to also was perceived threat of the people, and you don't blame them. I think if, if we were in their place, we probably would think the same. Perceived threat to identity and culture, changing patterns of ethnic religious diversity. I mean, suddenly uh, people are talking about Ramadan, they are talking about soccer feast, and they are talking about, uh, I mean, uh, all kinds of rights and, and e equality in terms of all the so the whole ethnic <coughs> mosaic or ethnic mix and religious mix that shifted and that changes uh, and that people suddenly if, if, if in that situation you start threatening people and say and and tell them about the threats which don't <coughs> exist actually and that's where right extremists have fantastic because they talk about a glorious future a glorious past which never existed and they talk about future threats which probably will never come. So it's all fictitious stuff what they talk about. So in, in, in total, a sense of loss of control of all, on that destiny. So because of all these this, this reasons, the local populations, they started feeling like, do we control our own destiny? Do, destiny, do we control our economy, our culture, our art, uh, our streets? And uh, they are all being taken over by some of these some strange guys. Uh, and, and that led to this kind of uh, rise of uh, uh, population. <laughs> now, I won't go through this, but this is just color-coded. The, the lightest one is ring, right-wing populists in Europe, where they are represented in parliaments. The, the medium blue is right-wing populists involved in the government. And the darkest is where right-wing po populists are running the governments, for, for example, in Italy now. So just, just to give you an idea. And, Populism has entered the mainstream politics. Again, I won't go through this. is list of countries and the number, percentage of uh, populist right-wing extreme uh, parties which have won the uh, seats of parliaments or uh, they are directly involved now in the mainstream politics. So that was the populism part, that uh, how, what has been feeding and what have been the, the key reasons for, uh, uh, for populism. And here, but and what they did, the populism did, they used the migrants and refugees crisis as a cornerstone of their agendas because they thrived on this kind of crisis. If you look at Cape Wilders, for example, for last seven, eight, nine years, eight years, he has, he has been a single agenda party, which was uh, get, the, get rid of Moroccans, close the borders, get rid of Islam, burn Quran, and blah, blah, blah. I mean, it was really a single point agenda he had his party, just polarizing the society and creating this hatred among the people and among the masses. So they actually made, they had a populist, they had a huge impact on refugees and immigrants in the sense, and not only the people who are coming now to Europe, but people like a lot of us sitting here who have been living 20, 30, 50, whatever number of years, already in Europe because we look the same, <laughs> we behave the same more or less. So everyone became a refugee and immigrant and was thrown into one big basket and they should be all thrown out. So it, this is how the society became polarized and this was a big impact. It's a very nice quote actually which, which gave me goosebumps to be honest. Uh, you all remember this picture. Uh, no one puts their children in a boat unless they believe that the water is safer than the land. I mean, no one for a washing machine for, for $90 or uh, uh, 200 uh, uh, euros a month or, or hope for a future job or something 
will take that kind of journey. I mean, if somebody paid you, <laughs> I mean, and people were here made to believe that they all are coming here to take our homes, to take our jobs, to take our social system and the, all the benefits uh, uh, without paying anything. I mean, thousands and thousands died and, and you will never put their kid, your kid on the boat unless you believe that the water is safer than the land they, are, they were living in. Any questions? Any comments? Okay, but we will do the discussion anyway at the, at the end of the session. Uh, our speakers today, and it won't be an understatement that we are so happy, so proud, so lucky to have Helen Yu today here and uh, uh, to take part in this uh, and to, to enlighten us with your thoughts. Uh, very, very brief introduction, and this is very brief so for someone like Helen, because you can easily write five pages on, on what she is and what she is doing, and this is being extremely, extremely modest. So, Assistant Professor in Development and Social Justice at the International Institute of Social Studies in, uh, in The Hague. For over 30 years, she studied the comparative asylum policies of EU in the context of broader post-colonial pro-asylum advocacy networks politics of selective urban surveillance of undocumented and rejected asylum seekers, detention and forced uh, deportations. Regional focus, please, uh, our second speaker, also known to everyone, uh, Alila, Alila Nur, she is uh, our <laughs> boss. And, uh, Anila, again, very, I took some highlights, I know you have done, and we are really, really, I am particularly proud of Anila because in such a short time, in a very difficult situation, she has achieved so much and made her mark really extremely well. And she is a graduate from Erasmus University, and we have Ustani and teacher, <laughs> teacher and her student here together. So, okay, share bakri ek ghat pani piyenge aaj, so that's... Uh, so yeah, Guru and Chela, so that's uh, very proud to have you. Uh, she is a refugee activist, consultant for various institutions related to refugees, uh, fellow of Open City Fellowship Netherlands, and a member of European Migrant Advisory Board, and initiator of New Women Connectors, a very wonderful, powerful movement, becoming very powerful, mo a movement striving for mainstreaming migrant and refugee women across Europe, uh, involved in subjects like forced migration, asylum, refugee policies, and advocacy for the rights of migrants. I think we couldn't have found better speakers than de these two for, for today's uh, topic. No. Please, uh, Doing this, anyone wants to grab a cup of coffee, tea, drink, chips, something, who, has, who is not fasting, please help yourself. And, uh, is this the one? No, no, no. Yes, yes, yes. Sure? Yes. Because there were two. Huh? No, no, yes. This is the one. Oh, no. This is okay. All right. There you go. Thank you. How do I make it big? Okay, I usually use PowerPoint, but today I decided not to because it tends to put people to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you! <laughs> <laughs> when, when there are too many, obviously, when there are too many PowerPoints. Um, Okay, I, I really don't have any answers for this issue of, of um, populism. I, I t I've used a different title. Uh, I've called it Illiberal Europe. What I mean by that is that liberalism was a dominant idea, liberal democracy, one person, one vote, that kind of thing. What we're getting towards is kind of Europe of the people. We're getting away from the idea of the individual as a bearer of rights towards the idea of groups carrying rights. And this is not a positive development. Uh, I want to give uh, five reasons why I think Europe has become illiberal, and I don't think Europe's alone, obviously, in this, but uh, it certainly is, uh, the things you've described are illiberal. 
So here are my here are my five. Uh, I think we've gone a bit too far. Hang on. My five criteria for like understanding the mess we're in. So I've also tried to explain it the way you also explained it. I'm going to start, however, with the environment, because I actually think that the environment is uh, a stressor that is sometimes conscious and sometimes not. But we now cannot deny any longer, any rational, reasonable person can no longer deny that environmental stress is with us globally. And whether we're living in Holland or in uh, Mozambique or in uh, the Midwest of the US or in some other part of the world, like Pakistan, we can't deny the frequency of flooding, the, the, the intensity of storms, the problems of sea, sea level rise, and so on and so forth. So that, that is there under the surface. And I'm going to come back to environment at the end, because I think environment's a really interesting way of working today. OK. So five different explanations, environmental stress, collapsible certainties. I think you've talked about that already. And I mean also the end of the Cold War and the end of left and right because we no longer really know what left and right means today with populism. Then uh, economic crisis and unemployment, perhaps I don't need to discuss that because you've already discussed that. And then nativism, I call it. In other words, you know, we were, we're from here and they're not from here. And that can apply to a group like the Roma who've been in Europe for 500 years so, uh, or more, <laughs> maybe 600, maybe 700. We don't know exactly when the Roma migrated, but it was definitely more than 400 years ago from northern India. Uh, and there's plenty of evidence of that, that they were a cast of, if you like, defeated warriors who wandered into <coughs> Europe, wandered into Turkey and came, and are still not accepted today in any country of Europe. Uh, to some extent, they've been, their situation is normalized in the Netherlands, because they're now called Sinti, and they're settled, and they have nationality. But no European country has fully accepted Roma as their equal. And I think that's a, there's a lesson for that for us somewhere in there. So funny enough, at the end, when I'm going to give you some hopeful messages, <laughs> uh, one of the hopeful messages comes from a Roma political activist woman in Sweden. And uh, I find that no coincidence that she's actually saying, look, we all need to get together when we're organizing. We can't organize separately between women here. And, and I don't think I need to tell this audience that. So I actually maybe don't have much of a message for you, except just to carry on doing what you're doing. OK, so and finally, I've got something called mirroring, which is very common at the moment. And uh, it doesn't get us very far. That's my argument. And then once, I, once I've briefly outlined these five things, I'll, I'd like to give some suggestions of how you know, we can work in the Netherlands. And I include myself in that. I don't, I'm not suggesting Pakistanis have a special role that they must take on their shoulders. No, I think it's every single member of society uh, how they can, we can all work on these issues. I'm hoping that it'll be of interest to you. So I'm gonna briefly talk at the end about the national plan against racism. The fact that there is such a thing, you may not have heard of it, but I'm gonna give you some links to this uh, plan. And also the fact that the plan uh, requires the government to consult with you at the local level. Not me, unless I've experienced <coughs> racism, which, I don't remember having experienced racism. I might have experienced other things, but I don't remember experiencing racism. One guy once shouted at me, Jew. <laughs> Jew, because I have quite a large nose. <laughs> I said, unfortunately not. I said, but the pity is you're Dutch. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not I don't feel like I, I could consult the local authority on that experience of racism, alarming as it was, because it was really just a one-off. And it was one drunken guy. And that hasn't happened to me again. But when you have repeated experiences of racism, you should go and see the municipality, the municipality and tell them, I understand that under your <coughs> national plan, you are obliged to consult people who experience racism. Well, here we are. We're coming to consult you. Uh, and you can do that formally. You can do that informally through contacts you have with municipality employees. But that is your right. So we'll come back to that at the end. Okay, so environmental stress, I think I've already discussed. Um, I think it's really important. The fact that the um, old certainties have all gone. We, we not only have um, no certainty between, say, the nice communist enemies that we used to have and the capitalist West that we used to uh, defend, but we've not really found a proper substitute for that enemy. 
like, you know, you can say, oh, Islam's an enemy, but actually it doesn't really work because we're close allies with Saudi. Um, it, it, Islam is such an ineffective enemy for the West that it's like too amorphous, too fluid, too diverse, too messy. Uh, the communist bloc was lovely because it was one <coughs> big, fat enemy bloc. And we didn't like China either. But the real enemy was the communist bloc, Soviet Union. That was that was a okay. We knew where we were. We had left. We had right. We had liberal. We had illiberal. We had authoritarian and democratic. Things were hunky dory for the West at that, <laughs> relatively speaking. After that, I think it became a mess. And I honestly don't know if we can speak today about left and right anymore. I'm not sure. I think we can speak about democratic and non-democratic. And I think you can get both on the left. You can get democratic left, you can get a very undemocratic left too. Yeah. So I'm not convinced that kind of populism is only right wing. I'm afraid it also can be left wing. Um, white people. <coughs> I like talking about white people because I'm a white person. And um, one of the things that's been happening with white people is like ignoring the history. So I'm going to say a, a few words later about history as well, and maybe what we should be teaching children in the curriculum so that we don't have Sparta Pete and things like that going on in Poland. <coughs> um, so I need to put my glasses on, I can't see. <laughs> so from... Um, so this is a nice picture. We've had a picture of this man already. I, I like this picture because it shows utter chaos all around him. There is not one person facing in the same direction. Uh, it says something about the, the kind of conflict-driven environment around such an individual. I find this picture very symbolic because everyone is looking out for themselves. Each one is looking to a different direction. It's utter, it's, it, just, uh, it looks like utter chaos to me. <coughs> um, it doesn't look like a kind of organized political activity at all. It looks more like a, a, a fight between football fans. Um, so we have powerful forms of collaboration which could, which could center on, for instance, the problem of employment, casualization, <coughs> all faced with things like zero-hour contracts, with uh, part-time work, agency work, poorly paid work, most of it at the minimum wage or just above, sometimes just below. Affordability is a big problem. I mean, it's a great skill in the Western world today being able to live with little. One of the most vital skills that we all have to cultivate is how to have less outgoings. And the reason for that is that we do not want to get into debt. Household debt is rising in countries which historically had no household debt, like the Netherlands. Usually it's just the US and the UK that had very high household debt. Now those patterns of consumption are spreading to continental Europe, and that's no good thing. So I'd say uh, living with little is a really important skill, but below a certain level, it's no longer a skill. It's just, you know, it's just suffering. So there's nothing romantic about living with little. Uh, racism. I'm going to talk a little bit about Sparta Pete. So there's something I call nativism, which is all over the world. As, as you pointed out earlier, it's, it's not just something in Europe. Nativism is about thinking that we are under threat. And poor white people, they're so vulnerable these days, have you noticed? They're hurting. They feel, they feel like Indians on a reservation. They're like the last of the Mohicans. You know, the white race is going to be wiped out by, let's see, mixing, different religions, uh, secularism. Uh, depends, depends where you are, what they're going to be mixed, wiped out by. So if you're in Italy, they're going to be wiped out by migrants. If you're in Sweden, they're going to be wiped out by socialists if, uh, and, and migrants. Uh, and so on and so forth. So white vulnerability is a big uh, part of nativism. In other words, you have to claim to be the victim before you can justify attacks on others. And that, I think, is common to all uh, extremist ideologies. The first step in an extremist ideology is look at poor us. We had a glorious past, you know, it could be Turkey, Russia, UK, India, it's all the same. We had such a glorious past, and then along came these like people, and look at us now, we're living in misery, it's all their fault. It's not the government's fault, it's not our fault, it's not because things go up and down in life. 
like empires rise and fall. No, some something somewhere along there's a conspiracy against us, and now we have to take action. We have to defend our blah blah blah. Whether it's Turkic, whether it's uh, white, whether it's um, Christian, whether it's any anything will do. And the fact is that none of these none of these policies offer a solution. Because not one of these nativist policies actually produces employment. Not one of them have a solution to problems of welfare. They have no welfare strategies. They have no programs except anti-immigration, anti-this, anti-that. So actually, people pretty quickly get disillusioned. E you know, even with Trump, they've got very disillusioned. They'll get disillusioned with uh, the guy in Italy too, because they can't produce the results that they promise. They promise that life will be better if we just get rid of X, Y, or Z. But it never is. It's never better. And one of the reasons it's never better is that it's very well established now that immigration is actually good for most countries. Let's say 19 out of 20 countries benefit from immigration. And that could be voluntary or involuntary. Refugees or migrants. So what's desired is not really changing policies, but this illusion of control, this searching for simple <coughs> truths. And that's why I say that we talk, we're talking about a period of anxiety. People feel anxious. They feel anxious for themselves, their kids, their futures. And this goes across the board. And people worry. And they think, gosh, I don't know the answers anymore. I need someone who does. I need someone who's certain and sure, even if they're speaking absolute rot, I'm prepared to give them the benefit of the doubt to see whether where that leads me. If I can, if I can get a way out of this mess or this anxiety by, by, by joining up to this movement or voting for this person. So let me take uh, an example of what's going on in Holland. I think there's a, a problem, a specific problem in Holland of denial. And I'm going to quote the United Nations a working group on people of African descent. And here's what they say about it. The working group feels that a large amount of the population, that is the Dutch population, including the Turkish and the Pakistanis and everybody else, um, <coughs> still does not understand why the manner in which Zwarte Piet is presented is perceived negatively and as hurtful by some groups of Dutch society. In the view of the working group, this is a symptom, the fact that this is not recognized or people don't understand why it's hurtful, this is a symptom of denial of the existence of racism and racist practice and an erroneous understanding of history among its society. It's also a mark of structural racism affecting the Dutch society. Okay, so a long time ago, somebody called Philomena Essid uh, actually more or less lost her job, although she says she didn't, but she kind of did. She kind of had to go and work in the States. And the reason was because she did a PhD which said that racism was so pervasive in Holland that people didn't even see it. She called it everyday racism. And she got in so much trouble with her colleagues. <laughs> they really didn't like the implication of this, that the society was so deeply ingrained with such ideas that they almost became banal every day. So as Warta Piet would be the worst example, I guess, every year. So mirroring, finally, is radicalization, it's mutual radicalization, so just in a nutshell, uh, you know, opposites needing one another. Because where would Bush be without Saddam? Where would uh, Osama be without the Saudi-US alliance? Where would um, Wilders be without some you know, pronouncement by a mullah somewhere about a fatwa on someone. Where would they be? They would be lost. They would be lonely. It would be like, um, you know, Romeo without Juliet. <laughs> so I'm sorry to say this, but I think they love one another. And you may never see that love, but that love is there. And one of the worst things that can happen to the far right in Europe is to defeat ISIL. And I have to say that I'm relatively optimistic that with the defeat of ISIL at the moment, if that continues, although it's spreading into different parts of the African continent, um, you know, you could see a de-radicalization of the right. Okay, I know I'm being ridiculously optimistic, but if opposites attract and they mirror one another, we working for the dismantling of one fundamentalism or one extremism can actually help to diminish the other's power and control as well. 
So mirroring means we can unmask the appearance that they're enemies. <laughs> they're not enemies. They have a common interest in projecting a two-sided fight in which both sides take part, which is just nonsense, anyway, to most of us. So the myth of white vulnerability in Europe, that the poor <coughs> Europeans are being taken over by other cultures and so on and so forth, that we're much too nice, we should be more nasty, you know, we just let them walk all over us, this kind of myth is mirrored by the myth of the loss of status and dignity by other leaders in other parts of the world who don't necessarily do anything for their own people, but who claim that the West is annihilating Muslims. And you can see how you could be anti-Semitic and pro-Israeli. <laughs> you, get, you get that. You could yep. be anti-Semitic and pro-Israeli pro simply because Israel is there fighting the Arabs. But you're not, you're not pro-Jewish. You're just pro-Israeli. Don't, don't confuse states with people. So the Bush administration, not so much, but the Trump administration certainly has some very strong anti-Semitic supporters, and yet Trump's son-in-law is, 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 is Jewish. So we have, within, within movements, you can have loads of these contradictions. But, but, but. So I want to say but, 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 and very, very quickly, for five minutes, I want to give you something hopeful. There are good prospects for organizing against racism. I do believe this. I do believe we're in very propitious times. We're in very creative times. I think we need not old people like me, but younger people like yourself, actually, on these platforms talking. Because I think the old people have not come up with any very good solutions. We have to be frank and hand over <laughs> to the young uns, <laughs> the 16, 20, 25 year olds, 30 year olds. I'm afraid they have to have the say now because we've tried everything as oldies, and we've failed. But let me give you a bit of optimism. Uh, in Sweden, they started a feminist party. You know, this is the first feminist initiative party in Europe. And one of the first MPs of that party was a Roma woman, from, originally from Romania, then moved to Sweden. And what they achieved was quite incredible. They, not only in Romania, but also in this party, the Feminist Party, they managed to get together uh, migrants, Democrats, feminists, LGBTQI, NGOs, Roma, and human rights groups, all together in one big alliance. Pretty impressive, because it's not easy to get all those groups together, including faith-based groups who objected to uh, divide and rule tactics that were going on on the right. So that was both in Romania and in Sweden. You see these alliances coming up. Um, so, you know, would any of you like to go to a gay pride demonstration? I don't know, maybe some would, but some would not. But try it one day. See how you feel. Do you feel very uncomfortable or just a little bit uncomfortable? You might not feel as uncomfortable as you believe. So, um, Broad collaboration is what she recommends, and um, you know she she recommends this to overcome conspiracy theories because there's so many conspiracy theories about what they are doing to us and how they may even be putting things in our water and in our injections and they may even be planning to annihilate us. Yeah, and and it's uh, the basis of lots of fundamentalist views. So I just want to read. Uh, yeah, and I would say class is not to be neglected because poor people everywhere are vulnerable to a system that seeks profit over, over, over welfare. And that's a very strong basis, should be a very strong basis for all our uh, organizing as class. So survival skills and things like that are very important for people irrespective of class. We don't know when we're going to be poor. Um, I could become very poor when I'm older because my pension might run out of money. It's very possible. So there's no security of that long-term perspective. So mobilizing within your own networks, encouraging others to vote, demand their rights, reach those who are isolated in the community, maybe who are marginalized in the community, who don't have high status, uh, lobbying vested interests in the community, um, all, all these things require us to get together with those we don't necessarily see as our friends in the first instance, but who we need them and they need us. Um, so that would be, say, religious people plus secular people, that could be women plus men, that could be women uh, working against violence with men working for male 
you know, liberation. It could be uh, LGBTQ with the uh, religious. That's going to be an interesting one. The mm -hmm. religious people working with the LGBTQ. It's going to be fruitful and very, very, I think, uh, much learning going on there, mutually. So there's a hope because not everybody reacts the same way to what you call populism, which I call nativism or liberality. Everybody works in, in different ways when under pressure. Unfortunately, not everyone follows people like Wilders and Trump and the new uh, president in Brazil. So this feminist initiative from Sweden, I'll just finish on a couple of these groups. They, uh, what they recommend, I'm gonna read a quote from her, Soraya is her name. And she says, we need to show that we can do politics differently and collaboratively. It's not only what we do, but how we do it. So how are we collaborating, seeking common grounds? It's more or less what you were saying about a respectful dialogue and trying to be as open as possible, which I really don't think I need to tell this audience. <laughs> but again, she says, we have to talk to people in people's language. The, the, they had something called home parties where they just would invite a local politician uh, from, from two different sides, and then they'd invite the community to come and have a dialogue with those politicians in somebody's <coughs> living room, basically. Uh, and they said, this is a good and easy way to start a relationship. A lot of people are sure they're not represented in the political system. That's why, for instance, they don't vote. But if you start this in your own neighborhood, you can, build, you can help to build a bridge between uh, communities and, and political uh, leaders. And not necessarily through making your own party, but through engaging with the existing people in the municipality or in the parties already. Finally, I want to suggest that there's maybe two levels at which in the Netherlands you can particularly work. The international level involves the UN, because the Netherlands is very sensitive to what the Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination says about it. That's an interesting one for some of you, if you're a lawyer, if you're some kind of NGO, if you, if you have some kind of representative body. Um, finding out more about CERD, the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, and when the Netherlands will re next report, you can even consider producing a shadow report. You'd have to get together with a lot of other organizations, but a shadow report on anti-racism in the Netherlands would be a wonderful thing to see at the CERD next time, because it would really document that the Dutch are doing a, an eye-washing exercise. They're basically washing the eyes of the committee by giving them a lot of flannel and a lot of stuff which is actually not happening on the ground about anti-racism. Because as you may know, the Dutch have a policy called the National, uh, I can't remember the exact name, but the National Action Plan Against Racism. So we have one, here we go, a nice cartoon. I hope you like that. That's builders crying because um, <laughs> advocacy is going on, saying hope over hate. So builders is upset. He doesn't want any hope. Um, so here we have, we've got a national action plans against racism are happening in different countries of the European Union, not most, but some. Belgium, for instance, doesn't have one, but Holland has one. So you have a framework within to work. Scotland even has one, Sweden has one, and Barcelona has one. And I'll just say a couple of words about Barcelona and Holland and then I'll finish. First, Barcelona's plan is the only plan in Europe, and this is why it's worth looking at, that includes Islamophobia as a central plank of its plan. It's the only plan in Europe as well that's got a very specific budget for fighting Islamophobia. So not only is the Barcelona plan, I'm not saying it succeeded 100%, but it actually explicitly deals with Islamophobia. None of the others do. They deal with anti-Semitism, they deal with racism, but they don't deal with Islamophobia. And secondly, it has a clear budget allocated to anti-racist work. The Dutch plan does not. The Swedish plan does not. Um, which is quite surprising, given the importance of this work. Let me finish then with, uh, here we go. Um, the, the, the plan in Holland is called the Anti-Discrimination Program of the Netherlands. It was put together in 2016. And the plan actually explicitly says that uh, in the Netherlands, the impetus for establishing the anti-racism program seems to have come from UN requirements. In other words, the, the, the Netherlands didn't do this because they love anti-racism. They did this because they want an impeccable reputation in Geneva. Mm -hmm. I have to be very cynical with you, sorry, but th I believe that this is why they did this. Otherwise, they wouldn't have done it. They would have been like Belgium. Um, 
And this is, a, this is the interesting part, is this last paragraph here in the Dutch program, this bit here, I don't know if you can read that. There is a strong focus on the local level, with an entire section dedicated to supporting municipalities and local anti-discrimination officers in implementing effective anti-discrimination measures. I think that's where uh, diaspora organizations can get together with others and have input there. Other organizations like yours, you know, LGBT <coughs> also include many, many minority groups and so on and so forth, and human rights organizations like Amnesty. And then you have a statutory uh, entitlement, and this is it. You have a statutory entitlement that although the setting up of national action plans against racism should come from government, they should be done with the active input and participation of civil society organizations and representatives of communities affected by racism. There you go. It's in black and white. You have an invitation to take part in this process, and I'm not sure that the Dutch government has actually yet fulfilled this, <coughs> this obligation. So hopefully you could be part of providing that input uh, in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. So my, my last sentence, I hope this has not only informed you, but also inspired and perhaps encouraged you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do you have a no, I am. So let's exit from here. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not standing, I'm just sitting. <laughs> so thank you so much. I don't know what to say after the talk of uh, Batistab and Helen. Um, I'm thinking to reflect on my own experience because last two years I am uh, quite busy on the European level and trying to give a meaningful participation of refugee and migrant on the policy level. So uh, while working on the European Commission and European Parliament, I felt all people who are coming as a politician who are, has the access in a European Parliament, they are just politicians. They are coming not as a leader. They are just coming as a politician in European Parliament. And whenever I have the chance to uh, go in to see and listen to their debates, they are talking about only about us, about migrants, about migration, how to put borders, how to stop them, because they are creating this kind of uh, as Helen and Bhattisab saying, they, they're creating a fear. There are so many things on the media about migrant and refugee, which is really horrifying them, some policy makers. And because that there is no representation from our end, there is no one from our end who go and say, no, this is not true. And I really feel this is our fault, like we are not involving ourselves, we are not organizing ourselves. We are not going to have a connection with them. We are not engaging ourselves in their debates. We are saying, okay, they are European Parliament. Like nowadays, it's elections are happening, and there are so many campaigns. Uh, how many are you personally involved in any campaign? Can you tell me? Are you in, involved in any election campaign? No? So no. look, why? This campaign, they spend a lot of money and effort because of us. But look how we react. We just say we are not doing this because we have our own family, our own culture, but we are living in Europe, and Europe is our home. Do we are ready to accept Europe as our home? I can say no. So how we can blame them? So we really need to accept like where we are. This is our home, and we have to protect. This is our right. We have to organize. We have to represent. We have to be a leader. We have to join these parties. And not like creating our own party, but why not join them who are talking about us, about our right? As Helen said, there's so many uh, policies, but we never think how we can work with them. Because we ourselves, we are thinking in our own box. We are not thinking to connect all of these things. And about the thing is that in European Parliament, people like uh, politicians who are coming from Hungary and Austria and from Netherlands, and as Helen said, from even Netherlands, they go to Brussels and they sign the, you know, some kind of papers, and when they come back, they say, oh, this is like Brussels environment, that's why we are signing it. When they came back in their nationalism, they're just politicians, and they said, no, we are not. Look at the practice. 
what's happened? Why it's happened? Because people were not organized and they just don't involve. They think it's not going to happen, but it happened and it has a more larger impact. That's why we just, it's like in Urdu, I'm going to say it like Urdu, so people can also, like, that's how we are reacting actually. We don't imagine how the impact could be more dangerous towards us. Like, because of my work, I'm too much in the policy paper of migration uh, agenda of 2015 on European Commission. And I was so shocked to see how much money they are putting on the borders, you can't imagine. And they're using the name of migrant and refugee. We need to stop, stop them. And how much they are giving millions and millions of dollars to Turkey to stop them. So we need to create some kind of role models and we need to work with them to show how much contribution we are doing. As uh, in my introduction, but as I've said, I created a movement where I really want to show the females, uh, the refugee and migrant contributors towards Europe to show their contribution as a power and how much they are doing. Because I believe there's a lack of representation, there's lack of leadership, and we really need to take this all, and we can, it's not like a, uh, any fantasy, it can be true. We can work together and we need to look at like, uh, like yesterday I was in a uh, event and it's like a kind of star party and there's like so many people because of star party but not here. Why? So this progressive kind of debate is really important to have and uh, even if we think the value of EU is more I inclusive, right? The EU have this value of inclusive but it's getting bad, it's getting away. And we need to take it back. We, we can stand. We, we can say we are standing for Europe. We are not standing for us. We are standing for Europe, which is united. Because Europe claim we are one. So we can say, we can say no, we are work, working for Turkish people. We are not talking about Moroccans. We are not talking about Pakistani. We are talking about Europe. We are New Yorkian. So we really want to reclaim our space. We really want to claim our right. So that's the, my message. Like We really want to give the message we are here to protect our Europe's value, which is more inclusive, more tolerant, and for everyone, not for one group. So we need to work together. Thank you. If anyone wants to get something to drink, then we'll start the discussion. Uh, if you all feel well fed, it's okay as well. Uh, we can take a break. Yeah, take a five minute yeah. break and uh, then re resume the. Because then we will have a question answers discussion, open discussion. Yeah. And we all know that all questions are welcome. Doesn't matter how controversial, how difficult, but on the topic, on the subject. It should not be about uh, something else. <laughs> okay, five minutes break. <laughs> Rose Rakri. I stood
Students. I went to one meeting, ISS meeting. There was this uh, Pakistani journalist who came there for a discussion in the Hague. It was nice. Uh, uh, interesting discussion. Maybe Karen Siegmund was there? Uh, a German woman? Yes, yeah. she organizes. Yeah, 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 she was the one. Yeah, her accent. She lived in Pakistan for years. Oh. She works with Lums. Like oh, years. yeah, with Lums. Yeah. That's an elite university. And exactly. she speaks Urdu as well. Oh, that's lovely, yeah? She always says, no, I only speak Urdu with me now. I'm doing Urdu. It's nice if you can. Huh? It's, uh, if you can. Because of her work, she learned Urdu. Good. Yeah. And she's becoming Dutch. <laughs> Is she becoming Dutch? Yes. Animals will be happy, yeah? Why? She's German. I don't know. Doesn't Maybe that does not make sense. Really I mean, if you're British, you can you have to become Dutch. But yeah. if, if you're you German, stay here. why would you become Dutch? I mean, she told me she's learning Dutch. Make to sense. Become, uh, for in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe it's not about where she's going, it's about what she's running from. Right? <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't want to be German anymore, so. Yeah, I don't get it. Yeah, because 
I don't get it. I don't think Dutch is better than German. I don't think Belgian is better than German. I don't think any of us. I mean, I don't think any of us. 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 I but then uh, our students, like my sister and I, because I can't become our Dutch, students, because I don't have a birth certificate. And since then, it's been a you're in black. You're like exactly, in the system. Exactly, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm in the black. So last year when I went, went, it was after nine years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I did try my father in the middle of my birth certificate. My mom sent him down a couple of years ago. But he wasn't working now. With that, as a Flemish nationalist, he didn't get an answer. He just didn't get an answer. Three years. That's like three years or something. Yeah, he didn't get so that was the last time. Yeah, yeah. 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 Scotland's having a referendum to get back in the EU. So we're just waiting around for the
if we do not have yeah. 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 a modern beyond their role as a housewife, even though find anything in common. Yeah, yeah. Because at the end of the and day, I'm sure you would have so much as well. My family. I have friends from high school that went and made that choice for themselves as well. But since I knew them before their choice, I I have a lot of problems them as well. Maybe if I met them today, I would know. I would feel like it's not like the path that I'm taking is going to be different from mine. So I cannot have a conversation. But that's not true. You can have a conversation with everyone if you agree to disagree. But if you do not agree to disagree, you don't want to say that no, but your decisions are wrong. They're wrong for you, maybe, but not for the past for an hour. And I think that's a, that's a really big problem with the left. Really, really, really big problem with the left. This judgment that I am so much better than you because you cannot see beyond your no, absolutely. But it's really a problem because if you think you're better than them, you're no better than them because they are better than you. Well, the same thing, the same, you know, they are better than No, no, but I, I would not blame the right for it because that's what they stand for. You know, the left says that that's not what I stand for, but they do exactly the same thing. It's really, really exclusive. It's not inclusive at all. You know, they would look at somebody who is wearing a head scarf and they would exclude it because mm, such, you know, barbaric ideas. Why am I judging that person before even giving that person a, a chance to, you know, reveal their personality? And it's not, a, it's not my right to make choices for somebody else. But who have you been meeting on the left that would exclude a woman? So my I have a lot of people. I have a lot of friends from Spain, feminists. And it's like, how can you call yourself a feminist if you're judging a person for a choice on some appearance? That goes from being a feminist doesn't make you a saint. That's a vicious. No, that's really But you cannot say that I am a feminist and I speak for all women if you just exclude, you know, a certain your point about intolerance. Okay. Yeah. But it's a bit. So, um, so I really so don't have a solution for it. Self-righteousness. It's not even a word. Uh, Mansoor, Zakaja, better. small crowd, I think we can have a very, really in-depth discussion and uh, choose, choose uh, questions which we can really deal with vertically rather than trying to be <laughs> spread horizontally. So who wants to go first? Any questions from anyone? Please uh, go ahead. I have a question. Yeah. <coughs> Um, yeah, because you have uh, done all of this research into uh, the rights of populism and so on, and how um, and the reasons you mentioned there, they were really uh, it makes a lot of sense. But what I would like to uh, understand a little bit uh, is that uh, our people who are working on this uh, in this area have they tried to look a little bit further back in history just before the wars, because somehow it seems like everything that is um, sort of presented as leading up to this moment is post-war Europe and going up till today. Mm -hmm. But if you think about the uh, Europe that was a monarchy, like all of Europe, but all of the world, was it just not the same? Is Are the, the, the multinationals not just a new face of the feudals that were then? It's like, how is it different? And if it is indeed not different, how do we expect to reach to something different? Because back then there was racism as well. Back then there was the uh, the disparity between the economic classes as well. There was a clear distinction between what is working class and what is not. Um, I feel like in the human history, as we have never as yet reached to a point where we have we can say that uh, um, things were going well because it seems like they have always been the same. It's just that. The term changes, what you call capitalism, maybe you used to call it 
something else, a kingdom or a monarchy back then, but it's, it's still more of the same. Okay, I can't answer that question. That question is too broad. Uh, I, think, I think we, we can't answer such questions. It's not true that things have always been the same. But I think what you're trying to get at is that the past is still relevant today. If that's what you mean, then mm -hmm. I agree with you. And that's why, for instance, teaching about the history of colonialism, slavery, is essential in Europe especially. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, people will say, oh, we did a lot of good. We brought railways to India. That's what some of the Brits say. Mm -hmm. But even the rudimentary education through media of what actually was involved in imperialism leads people to understand that, you know, there is, there is no justification for what we did. Our history is really pretty horrible. Mm -hmm. And it's not just in India or in Pakistan. It's in Ireland, too, and in Scotland, too, and in America. It's, it's global, and it involves all empires. So from, you know, from, from the Saudi kingdom to the British, to the Turks, to the Russians, empire is never pretty. <laughs> and it is global. It's universal. I mean, even the Chinese fought about which bits were belonging to which emperors and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. So it's not, it's never been a nice, cozy, democratic process, which is, I think, what you're getting at. But I can't answer such general questions because um, I don't think it's true that nothing has changed. We had a long period when income really was being redist redistributed from the rich to the poor. And that started in the... Uh, at least in Western Europe, that started in the late 19th, mid to late 19th century, and it continued up to about the 1970s, when the actual poorest 40% were getting a higher share of income, and the richest were actually starting to be squeezed a little bit. Now we've seen a complete reversal of that in the last 25 years, and that's one of the problems, I think, that produces these anxieties that relate to populism. I don't have any answers, I just say... The only thing I wanted to get back to was the ecological dimension of all this, because maybe some people are asking, well, what can I do? And I heard you in the break talking about some women who you know, were talking with each other. Um, I think one of the things you can do is you can do something in your neighborhood. Uh, I've seen, I know it sounds very banal, but is there mm -hmm. any empty land in your neighborhood at all? Mm -hmm. Any? None. Uh, well, if you can find some. Uh, you can start like a little community gardening project. I know it sounds banal, but it really is an amazing way of bringing people together because they're mm -hmm. actually working together. So whether it's in a garden or whether it's in a workshop or whether it's in a, a, a some activity that people can actually do, not just blah, blah, talk, do something, do, do some work together, mm -hmm. any kind of work, cleaning up the garbage around your streets. That's what I actually do at the moment. And it, it just it means that you're doing something that you, and then you, you actually don't have anything in common, but you create something in common. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting aspect of physical work. And physical work like painting, decorating, gardening, cleaning, I believe in that. And I'm an academic. I don't believe in big discussions and answers. I don't think they work. Mm. Can I say something? No. no. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. No, I think uh, <clears throat> your question was uh, extremely interesting and because what you were essentially saying is that the situation today, if we can put it into a historical evolutionary perspective, then we can probably better understand where we are coming from. And these contradictions and these uh, class struggles, they prevailed in, in every society. So I think there are very, it's a lot of very interesting literature if you are interested in, in, in reading that, and some articles, some books. And uh, one book which is Sapiens, who was the name of the writer? Um, hmm? Yuval Noah. I, I know, yeah. yeah. It's, it's a wonderful book, uh, it's been an international bestseller, yeah. and that gives you a, a whole perspective, historical overview in a very brief and very readable way, mm -hmm. in how these societies emerged and transform into one another. And I think, but if you look at it more economically or scientifically, the, <clears throat> the means of production, these, that, that is the key factor which has changed actually human societies. 
when any means of production, it became old enough and could not go with the developing society, there were forces to change it. And then owning that mean of production, means of production was always the dominant uh, class, and the rest was, uh, and you are right that it took a uh, form of feudalism, then it, uh, uh, colonialism, feudalism, because colonialism, colonialism created feudal, feudalism in many, many places, because in India, for example, feudalism in that sense did not, there were small kingdoms, lordships and everything, but the, the land was distributed free to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. There was no record of uh, private land ownership before that, before colonialism, colonial period. Everything belonged to the king and uh, nothing to the people. And that land was given as a reward mm -hmm. to be loyal to the, to the colonial masters. And that the feudalism movement started in that. And because you, are, you gave to feudalism, feudalists, and you send your people to collect the taxes from those people. So a new form of repression is started. And when people outgrew uh, feudalism, then you saw in countries like Pakistan, which is a very interesting case in India, because in India, feudalism was banned officially after the independence. But in Pakistan, it never was uh, handled properly. And it became a semi-feudal, semi-capitalism. And then comes capitalism because with the industrial revolution and with the, all the new means of production, natural resources, capital, banks, and so on and so forth, you need a different kind of setup. So you saw the capitalism, and when capitalism rose beyond national capitalism, it became imperialism, which you see now, multinationals, companies buying companies from, uh, or going and uh, owning the economy of other countries. So this thing will continue, and this has impact, obviously, on the rest of the society how people behave, because more control, the stronger control you get on people, uh, the more you can make them behave the way you want. <coughs> so there are this, lots of very interesting uh, uh, articles and books uh, on this subject which shows the evolution of mankind and evolution of systems. And even before that, I mean, the, the Stone Age, uh, Copper mm -hmm. Age, uh, hunters and uh, hunting period, and when the the, the what do you call it, uh, Keti Bari, yeah? Yeah, agriculture. Agricultural revolution, when agriculture started, when people started, so in domestication of uh, animals and everything which came with it. So that all changed the structure of the society. <coughs> yeah. Who was... into context, huh? because one of the questions uh, you had was, is, there a dif is it not different from what it was in the past? I think there's a big difference now. Yeah. You have minorities able to be represented, <coughs> LGBTQ uh, uh, groups, but also women. Uh, women are still a minority when it comes to a lot of things in, in a lot of countries, but in Europe, female voices are more important. They are uh, getting more um, involved in the working force uh, section, and, and racism is something we can discuss and, and point out to that <coughs> groups within the government where you can uh, mention it. So that's something that wasn't that, that strong in the past. That has changed, so we can use that. Right? So, how can we use it in an imperialistic or a capitalistic society? I think uh, minorities have more uh, uh, voice power, more uh, are able to be stronger now if we unite, as you were mentioning. But that's also my question towards you. You were asking why aren't we involved in Europe? Uh, I have difficulties with politics in its essence. It's uh, I feel estranged from politicians. I have a problem, they don't represent me, they are far away, they are almost like these, even the left, I am a left wing thinker, I don't feel represented by them. They don't speak my voice. And, and that's my main problem, I do vote. I know my vote is very important, but I don't feel trusted and heard by them. Uh, by them. So that's my main problem with uh, why I am not active so maybe you can reflect on that, how we can change that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, involvement comes on so many levels. When I said we need to engage, we need to organize, it doesn't mean we go and make our own party. No. It's not, I'm saying no. I'm just saying we need to understand. Because so far, the question which I heard all the time on European Parliament, on some, this kind of platform, they will always say, you are not representative, inclusive rep representative. Why should we talk with you? And this one, and second, they say, we don't know where to find migrant and refugee leaders. So 
that's the thing I'm saying we need to engage. We need to talk and go to the parties' uh, discussion, go to the <coughs> party. A simple thing I've said, like, just join the campaign mm -hmm. about voting. It's not about any party voting. Mm -hmm. It's just like go and cast your vote. So we can engage, we can talk. And as you're saying, you feel distance. This is the reason you feel distance. You can go on the, their open the, uh, mm -hmm. debates and you, can get, and you can ask them questions. Like, I don't agree with your this point, I don't agree with your this, this. But don't sit at home or don't say, like, uh, I'm feeling distance. How much you are doing, like, individual, what we are doing as an action, as Helen said. We have to talk, but we also do something. And it could be very small thing. You can post anything, like, why should we vote? It's not about uh, doing some uh, uh, marketing for some political party, but just how we can promote democracy in New York. So I think yes. most people here in the group do these small things, yes. I, I think. Yeah. Because these small things, for sure, uh, most are involved eh, in stimulating people to vote, especially our own minority groups. Um, I do have an example which is interesting, because I work in the field of medicine, mm. and uh, we uh, doctors always complain that decisions are being made, yes. how healthcare is is set up in Holland, and, and one of the main problems is doctors are not present at um, these meetings. Morning. And so we have also, meeting. as doctors, had this conversation, we need to be involved, yes. because policymakers are not from the working field. From, uh, they're not healthcare yeah. people, they're yeah. often people who have done an MBA or whatever, and they're politicians. And some doctors are now uh, getting mobilized mm -hmm. to be present at different parties day to day, or whichever party is present to discuss um, uh, more from the, uh, let's say, working field, experience practical, field, yeah. in the practical yeah, life, yeah. what needs to be changed and which policies are really stupid. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's everywhere in a way, but then how do you make time? That's also difficult. Yeah, I, I just to add it, his question is related, again, the, you know, engagement with politics or politicians or otherwise. Do you think, I know you, and do you think <laughs> you are engaged in politics or with politics or you are with any political party or you have a lot of non knowledge about <laughs> what is going around in politics, yet you are doing, uh, you are contribu uh, contributing a lot. Yeah. So how is it possible? How can we manage with, our, you know, like he's a doctor, there are engineers, there are, you know, there are, uh, uh, marketing persons or otherwise some people like me you know n now engage in IT sector or uh, uh, there are people who can hardly uh, uh, make a living and yet how they can engage themselves it is it is quite a question so how could we do it I said earlier, like I am not affiliated with any political party as such, and I'm personally I'm also not a political person. I mm -hmm. run away far, far away from politics. But the thing is that I do want to advocate for that democracy. I do want, and I do always engage myself in the campaigns. And I'm uh, officially and my, from my job I'm uh, related with. This time I'm voting. This is a campaign. Mm -hmm. You have uh, vote our future. This is again campaign and vote your part. I'm also engaged there. Mm -hmm. And it does not require me to spend even a single penny, just my time, mm -hmm. just to my contribution. And because of social media, we record our small videos, message, mm -hmm. why is it important to go and vote. Either it's like national level or European level. Uh, this kind of contribution, because people want to see what other people are saying. People really want to see encourage mm -hmm. and appreciation. And this is the thing we want to change, the mentality, especially uh, I'm working with different kind of communities, like from Syrian, Sudanese, Eritreans. What's happening, they all are living in their own corners. Mm -hmm. They are not even interacting with each other, and we are talking about Europe. So mm -hmm. we need to even reach with each them. And it's not like uh, who is wrong and who is right. It's just like come together on the table and discuss and to be feel more inclusive with each other. How do you reach them? How do you reach all these small communities? Yes, uh, so what we are doing, we are trying to create some kind of summits, conference, debates, and we pay for their travel, we pay for their mm. food. 
and we really encourage them to bring uh, all refugee-led, migrant-led organizations and ask them what they need. Because we are not saying we need something from you. We go and say what you need from us. Mm -hmm. And it could be like uh, capacity building, it could be like advocacy, trainings, and we're trying to make a network of networks. Mm -hmm. and, and could I suggest it could be asking for some land for a garden? <laughs> <laughs> so that you can grow your own types of uh, gourds, yeah. or you can grow herbs from home that you usually would buy fresh. And you can spread them among each other. Yeah. You can just yeah, have yeah. them. Yeah. And these, these, <laughs> these things actually work really yeah. well. Yeah. Really they, they, they use them in, in Holland. We have these neighborhood contacts. Eh? They have mm. these neighborhood projects. There's money allocated. So you yeah. can get from yeah, the You can local get local money for money. them. Absolutely. 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 As long as it's multicultural and, and as long as you include it disabled everyone. people, yeah. youth, every sector of society. Yes. So the more inclusive your proposal, mm -hmm. that it's not a Pakistani garden, yeah. no. mm -hmm. but yes, that it's a multicultural, flowery, powery garden. Muslim tomatoes. Seriously, and it can have faith-based people involved, because that's a very important thing, Ooh. it's a spiritual dimension. I think someone, someone just fell, fell short. Someone or something. Okay, okay but <laughs> in, in addition, like maybe it would be something like a, like a kitchen a project, or cooking project, or cookery project, or anything. It doesn't have to be political with a big P yeah. for it to bring the mm. community together. So it could have a debating element, but as, as Anila said yesterday when they had IFTAR yeah. together, yeah. it brought people that wouldn't normally yeah. join. That's mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, in, if I... <laughs> Do a 30 second commercial for OPP. <laughs> <laughs> and is it, you, you saw the purpose, the, the vision, and the mission, and uh, the kind of topics we have chosen to, to do our events around them. And they were all selected carefully on this, this basis because you can, I mean, generally, very generally, split your engagement into three different categories. One is political. Now, everyone is not political. If you are political, and it's, I think almost everyone has some kind of political inclination, right, left, center, religious, whatever you want to call it. I'm not saying which one is better than the other, but some, some kind of political inclination. So you will certainly find political parties, groups, which come pretty close or are identical to your own uh, political thinking. So you can work with them. doesn't matter what, what it is. The second one is the social, which is much broader actually, because you live somewhere, you, you grew, grow up somewhere, you interact with people, you have neighbors, you have uh, kids, you have kids' friends, and so on and so forth, extended families. And so, as you are saying, I mean, do something with your social contacts. And, and that is the richest area where we can do. But I think this is where we keep on saying we are excluded from this society in many ways, but we exclude ourselves as well. Yeah. And I am tired of giving this example, and we all know that. I have been to so many Pakistani birthdays yes. or, yeah. or weddings, Wedding. and you know all this. I mean, mm. tons of real life examples. I mean, went to a couple of, quite a few weddings of the kids who were born here, who hardly speak Urdu, have never been to Pakistan, went to a Dutch school, Dutch university, and uh, living in a Dutch neighborhood in an apartment with probably no other nationality around them except Dutch. But when I go to their wedding, I, did, I saw two, about more than a hundred guests, and there were two, sorry, white <laughs> Dutch girls who were girlfriends of that girl getting married. And I was standing there and wondering, she was born here and, and, and the rest of it. And, and the whole family living here for 30, 35 years, they know only two teenager girls from Holland in all those 35 years? Why are they not invited? I mean, why? I don't understand. But you could reverse the argument. Have you been to many Dutch white weddings? How many <laughs> yeah, Dutch exactly. No, no, but you yeah. can. You <laughs> can. That's no, no, but I, 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 I have been to many, 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 like yeah. 60, 70, 80 people. Yeah, but for you, it's different. Right? And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a multicultural family. Yeah, yeah, no, but, but I go to many Dutch, you're absolutely right. And I am the only one with yeah. some color there. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and then I said, I mean, you guys keep on complaining about 10% population of people like me. Where are they? Don't you know anyone? And I came over because I'm married to her. Yeah, I mean, it's a valid question. So, but we are talking about us and not for yeah, them. When we talk to them, we will talk about them. But okay. this is our initiative. 
it's our initiative. I went to a graduation party of a daughter of my, uh, my very good friend. And again, 70, 80 people, not one person was, uh, was, was the native, if you want to say. I mean, and, and why? I'm not native. No, but this, yeah. this is, and, and I think, and then we have to get out of this victim mode, that we are like victims of something, and, and we are being by force isolated, and we have to, so these are the three areas, I mean, basically the, the political, the social, and the economical. Economics. Economics basically, we work somewhere, <laughs> we earn our money, we make our living, and we have colleagues. I just don't understand. No, but this is, to be honest, I mean, it's not about me, but even when, uh, when we were not married and I was living in, in, in Germany, uh, I was on my own, I had uh, friends, a group of friends, you won't believe it, I mean, <laughs> black, white, yellow, pink, <laughs> and so, so it is really up to us to, to take initiatives, whichever we can, to make sure that uh, these things start rolling. You? Please. Yeah, so, um, I um, have a very abstract, I think, comment. I don't think even it's, it's a question. Um, I'm a biologist and um, I uh, tend to look at every human behavior in the evolutionary terms. Like what is the evolutionary basis for hum this particular human behavior? Um, and because all, to me, all human behavior has an evolutionary basis. And to me, the most important step for a species is self-preservation. Uh, that's just what every species does, right? And I think, to me, the root cause of racism and um, this them against us is based in self-preservation of <coughs> us, whoever we are. Um, that is my thing. <coughs> now, we might, uh, uh, people might disagree with me, and I would really like to, if, if I am being completely bonkers, you can tell me that I am and give me <laughs> arguments, like why that is not so. But being that is so, if we assume that that is so, then my counter argument is towards that human behavior is that we have changed human behavior for other things. We don't, we wear clothes, we ride in you know, bicycles, we drive cars, we have, you know, we have changed human behavior over time. So why is this that this behavior is not changing? This need to maintain us against them is not changing. I, to me, there has to be some sort, some reason for it to stay in the society through millennia. And I know you guys are gonna, you know, I mean, have, I've heard all of these, but I keep coming back to this, this question. Like, what is it? So, whoever wants to take this and tear down my argument, I'm, you know, like, completely open. <laughs> Okay, so an you can Englishman. You start by saying that she's bonkers. No, <laughs> she's, she's absolutely not bonkers. An Englishman, an Irishman, a Jew, a Muslim, and a, let's see what can I think of more, and a, and a Scotsman go into a bar, and they have a chat and they have a drink, and that's because they're not bloody idiots. <laughs> that's that's yeah. that's, a, that's a joke. It's yeah. a Scottish joke. And the joke is put about because the typical ending of the Englishman, the Scotsman, the Irishman, and the Jew, and the, is that there's some kind of conflict, and they're all stereotyping each other, mm -hmm. and there's a fight. And I just fundamentally disagree, because if we are a species that preserves ourselves, we preserve the whole species. 
No, but the... Okay. Sorry, that's my uh, understanding of what species preservation behavior involves. The whole species. And we would save species. someone else's child from... S we do this all the time, yes, we but we just don't yeah. see it. Yeah. Like, we have a bias for thinking that we only help our own. That's actually just not true. We empathize with people thousands of miles away. We adopt each other's children with no problems. We actually can save someone from a, a, a drowning in a river who we've never met before. <coughs> we're perfectly wired for that. So I actually don't believe that even biologically we're attuned only to our own communities. The majority I just don't of accept people that. are normal. It's the minority of, for instance, these populists who are raising uh, in or power, but the majority. You need to speak to yes. the microphone. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> No, I, I totally agree with your point because the majority of people, the people you don't hear, are doing good and they don't hate each other, be it Islamic people or any other religion or subgroup or race or whatever. So majority does accept each other. You don't hear about it. That's also one of yeah. the things. So we're trying to make a voice, of, a, a counter voice of people who are not her being heard right now. And the other answer to your question would be an alien invasion, because then we will be one species. But then, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, going to the topic, eh? so uh, there is a rise in populism or these uh, negative groups, which are um, uh, which are uh, strength, <coughs> strengthened I in an important way because of this influx of uh, immigrants. So, what are your ideas of countering it? What, how could, how can we, in the long term, counter this problem? Because um, wars will come more and more in the future. Eh? You were speaking about environmental effects, the negative effects in the in, in, in Sahara region or in Pakistan. All these regions will increase in time. So uh, drought and things like that. Um, uh, so the influx of and migration of people will increase and people will tend to migrate to Europe. That's easier to access. So how can we counter these subgroups of populist people? How can we do this? I find it quite difficult to answer. Um, it is difficult, no doubt. And first step is to admit it's difficult, but it's not impossible. If I give you an example, which I always fascinating about thinking, when people go to NASA, they are all one. They never say, okay, oh, we are Americans or something. They go as a one team to NASA because they want to find something together. They work with Russians, they work with Chinese, and they just go into the space. I, International and, Space Center. It's, you, you, it's, yeah. it's a one team. So this is the point. This is our answer. We need to act as a one team. And we really want to show, and we really create image what kind of Europe we want instead of uh, creating or criticizing not we don't need to uh, you know react but we really would need to act in a positive way we don't need to create some kind of reaction because again it's mirroring those thoughts which they are blaming us we really need to understand and to think how we can act towards that so, so we have a big debate going on in history whether people are essentially this or essentially that or whether the, the true nature of human nature is A, B, C. Are we essentially selfish? Are we essentially altruistic? Do we care more about our nearest and dearest? Or are we capable of caring about people on the other side of the world? Well, I think all these debates will never be resolved. And for me, populism personally is something very modern. It's not traditional. It's got nothing to do with monarchy. It's got nothing to do with feudalism. It's got everything to do with capitalism, and it may even have to do with environmental stressors. That's my honest view. So if you want a biology of what I think we're facing, it's that politicians have no control over their environment. Uh, corporations have very little control over their environment anymore, despite the fact they feel they do. And people in local communities certainly have very little control over their environment. So the less control we actually exercise over our environment, the more that our inventions take over our lives, the more we become stressed and alienated. And the more we're looking for simple solutions. Mm -hmm. And they're pseudo-solutions. And they're not solutions that will satisfy us for long. And that's why I'm not pessimistic about defeating populism. Because I do not think it will rise and rise. Because it provides absolutely no answers for our planet and for us. Or for other species, for that matter. Will so it help? we depend on other species. You know, without bees, we have no honey. Without bees, we have no fruit. Without 
flowers, we don't have any pollen without, po I mean, it's, it just goes round and round and we can't survive without the rest of the planet. So at the end of the day, um, not only do we need each other, but we need the whole infrastructure that we are busy destroying at the moment without really understanding as a species what we're doing. I think our problem is really our, we have the, all these skills. That's Modernization right. we, is the problem? No, we, <laughs> no, we have all these skills that other animals don't possess. And we've been tremendously successful in using them. So successful that we can't keep our environment stable. Uh, yep. I, I just want to add, I recently I watched a movie. Uh, and uh, it was a movie like uh, aliens are coming to destroy <laughs> humans. And uh, humans are trying their best to save themselves. And in the end, it's discovered those were not humans were coming, they were humans, and they were destroying the reports. So who were thinking they are humans, they were reports. So this is the true, mm. which side of story we are listening. It was a big shocking for me in the end, but it discovered there were reports. And somehow they become, uh, you know, reboot their cells, and they forgot their memories, and they're thinking they are human beings. And they were living there, and the human beings are trying to destroy Reclaim. them. Reclaim. So this is actually happening. We need to listen which side of story we are listening and which kind of story are going in the society. Yeah. One question? If there? Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, coming back to our uh, Pakistani diaspora, uh, what uh, may be my observation right or wrong, but uh, again, like other diasporas, they are also living in their boxes. They, they like uh, uh, human rights, uh, they like uh, democracy, they like uh, social uh, support system here, they like uh, freedom in Europe, but uh, on the other hand, they don't, I'm uh, sorry, they don't like populism in Europe, they don't like nationalism in Europe, but they like sim similar things uh, should be happen in Pakistan. They like populism in Pakistan or India, they like nationalism, uh, they like uh, democracy not to run properly, they like to curb uh, the rights of minorities, LGBTs and other uh, minority religious communities otherwise. So why, why is uh, this phenomena, while they are still living here, they are getting benefits out of, uh, from here, but uh, they are not living here, but they are living there, or either they are living over there, they are not living here. What is this phenomena? Very interesting. You want to have a go at it? <laughs> I think it's called being here and being there. <laughs> so they really want to have all the luxury, the benefit Europe giving them financially or otherwise. But they really want to live the fantasy the moment they left Pakistan, the moment they left India or any other country. Because I met so many Pakistani here. And I felt they are still living in 70s or 80s. Yes. So in the, they're living in their fantasies. And they really want the fantasy to live alive in their countries. Because they believe their country should have proper 100% Islamic views in Pakistan, especially. But here, they really want to have scholarism, freedom of religion, so they can practice their own religion. So it's like, it's so complicated to answer. It's not easy to answer. But the thing is that we need to understand where we are living. Again, I'm coming to my point. They, those old people don't think they are living here as a home. They just think it's, it's as if like a money machine. <laughs> they are here to earn money and send it back. But they don't appreciate if we want freedom, same <coughs> rights, speech of freedom in Pakistan. Because they don't think this kind of democracy is good for so-called Islamic isolation of Pakistan. So it's quite difficult to answer. So 
So I just want to come back to the lady who's a biologist and respect your discipline, <laughs> because I think, you know, you, you definitely have things you can teach us from sciences about uh, how human beings behave, and I'm, I'm sure there's absolutely nothing wrong with an evolutionary perspective. My only question was whether an evolutionary perspective really leads us to the conclusion that people are intolerant of strangers. I just question that. That's all I was questioning. I wasn't questioning, like, an evolutionary perspective as such. Right, and so for your example, that you know people are philanthropic towards each other, that they don't have any um, uh, affiliation with. <clears throat> to me, in my head, the answer to that question is that as long as that philanthropy does not threaten them, they will do it. Once it starts thre threatening themselves, then th their own self, their own group, their own land, their own tribe, they will not be so philanthropic, is what I think is the issue. Um, so to me, your example of we are, we are all you know, one species, yes we are, but within the species there are differences, and a white and a black <coughs> skin color differentiates us, and becomes you know, one, <laughs> is white and one is black, and that is um, that makes us different. Is it a different species? No, 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 no. But <coughs> it, it creates this otherness, right? You are somebody. Uh, otherness has been created actually by human, by one species. That, that's not true. I think it's it's a, it's a nature everywhere. There is in each tribe of lions, there's one alpha. They're all lions. And they would kill each other to become the alpha. Mm -hmm. I think it's the need to consolidate power and control over your own but destiny. But we are human. We, we are intelligent. But biologically, we are not human. We are, we are, we are, we are not animals. No. The closest animals to us. Yeah. Sorry, the closest animals to us are the oh, higher primates, the chimps, and they they ha have been observed like in in nature rather badly, frankly, by Jane Goodall. <coughs> Friendly. I'm sorry to say that, folks, because I know you know it's not oh, a no. decent thing to mm -hmm. say, but it's true. But, but and I, and and they're not very good at nuclear families either. So, the, so you know, if we go to our closest relatives in the animal kingdom, we can with highly sociable, highly uh, <coughs> playful, and and rather sexual beings. Which I mean, I'm too old for all that. But you know, the fact is that we don't come out with like lions. We don't come out with swans, deers, or stalking antlers. Uh, we come out with a very social uh, dominant group where neither male nor female is that dominant, actually. So, and the bonobos are roughly the same size for male and female. So the idea even of women being smaller, it is, it's a cultural thing. Okay. It's because smaller women have been selected through history. It's not, there's actually not a huge difference biologically between our closest ancestors, between the males and the females. We've made that difference. And, and so there's lots of interesting things in terms of our closest relatives. They don't give us the lessons that we get from the birds or the bees or the fishes or the lions, but the closest relatives give us quite different lessons, that we're very social, mm -hmm. that what we suffer from is when we get lonely, and that what actually makes us attracted to populism is isolation, social isolation, and being deprived of social contact not only with the opposite sex, but with our own sex, with, with other human beings. And I think the loneliness of life in the West is one of the things that can very, very well explain the attraction of populist movement. And frankly, it must have got lonely in Brazil at some point, because otherwise people would not be flocking to the right wing mm. there either. I don't know what happened, but something went wrong. Something has gone badly wrong with our societies, where we <coughs> just don't feel, you know, love. So we go out and follow some idiot who's going to love us. Well, so if, I, I if, if I may add, add just, just it's a comment. I think uh, uh, it's, it's one species, the human beings, and I think self-preservation of, of as human being, I understand that, agree with you, you, you both. But I think the rest of these borders, the way they have been created, it has been ingrained in us. I mean, you see, I give you just a hypothetical, or not, not so hypothetical example. If I'm belong to a village, if there is a threat to that village, my identity is that village, because I will do everything possible with all my villagers' 
uh, others to protect myself against the next village. But if that district is under threat by the next district, I suddenly become friendly with my next door who I was fighting yesterday because now we have a bigger threat. And, and when that district is under threat by the bigger district or the provincial something powers, mm -hmm. then we, we unite as a whole province. And, and keep on going to the city, to the province, to the country, where nationalism comes like, yeah, now my borders are under threat. Now we all suddenly become Pakistanis. Yeah. And when whole Pakistan is under threat, uh, if we curse India or Israel or whoever, we all become Pakistanis. When I'm absolutely convinced when whole Europe will come under threat where we live, suddenly it will become our home. Mm -hmm. And we will think we are going to defend Europe. And if the whole world is under threat by aliens, we would be one decent family, all human beings. Yeah. We are the human race. We have to protect ourselves. So this is how this whole thing actually grows and grows and grows. And it boils down to what we call an identity which has been given to us and, 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 and created. You want to say but on the other hand, we have got a common threat. We of course. Have, we, yeah. have, we have a common threat right yeah. now. And the yeah. problem is we're not uniting. That's why I said, get the older people out and get the younger people in, yep. and get the younger speakers in, because the kids, for instance, in school are actually doing something about this. They're going out on Fridays, and they're actually taking time off their own education to raise the issue of the climate and to st tell people, wakey, wakey. Uh, I think on this note, I would like to just appeal the younger people to come and, and become more active on OPP platform and, and take it over from older people like me <laughs> and the and, and the rest. Uh, question? Uh, uh, another question? Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Hi, uh, so these, these groups and these populist groups, uh, you're saying they will provide pseudo answer and, and the people are voting for them. They, they won't uh, appeal eventually to them when, when they get power. So will this be also the answer to this problem? Give them power. Let them play out the game. And then people will maybe see uh, that it doesn't answer and, 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 and uh, give them the, the hope they were hoping for. But they have been in power now in India and they yeah. selected <laughs> them for the second term. Yeah. The, if you look at human history, yeah. um, the, gen the generation after the war is very inclusive because everything that was before is destroyed. Mm -hmm. What happens over time is selective memory, nostalgia. Mm -hmm. That's why the people who move here in the 70s, irrespective mm -hmm. of Pakistanis, Turkish, Moroccan, Irish, Scottish, they are stuck in that past because mm -hmm. of selective memory. They have forgotten everything that was bad, the reasons they left. They only remember what was good and what they missed. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that happens over time, and it becomes like glorifying so much so that the present becomes unbearable. And then you try to do everything in your power to destroy the present. And then you destroy the world. And then the next generation is more inclusive. So it's like a cycle. And that comes back to my first question, that it repeats itself over time. Populism is what is now. Before was something else. So why have we as humans not been able to find a solution to this? Why do we have to reach to this point where we destroy everything in order to rebuild it? Yeah, I agree with you. And uh, quite impressed with the depth of the knowledge you have poured into our minds today. Um, great appreciation for both of our scholars. Um, as a political activist, I strongly believe in active political participation. Uh, I rather think it very holy. And uh, we should be 24-7 active in politics. This is our uh, question of our survival. Looking at the polls, I don't think populism is a, a genuine threat to the democratic society or to the human existence. Uh, but I don't agree with the, that we should give the populace a chance to rule over the world and make their point by destroying everything because Europe has recently seen and the world has also seen enough of the destruction caused by all the uh, migrant <coughs> loving uh, Mussolini, yeah. Hitler. And um, so no need to give a chance and unfortunately we, we are seeing it in our beautiful Pakistan as well. We have, yeah, we have given someone a chance who didn't really deserve it and see what's happening now. So uh, when, you, uh, yeah, when you give the monkey a gun, he, he doesn't know how to, to fire it. And uh, well, uh, I strongly believe that we need to be active in politics. 
we need to join political parties. We need to join the local political parties. Um, I was very hurt to see in Amersfoort, uh, where I went to buy halal meat, um, in the, for the European elections, there was a poster lying on the counter, and it was uh, only uh, campaigning for two, uh, two politicians who belonged to the, to the same uh, bloodline from which the owner <laughs> of the shop came from. If we stay in our circle, we, we, we will give rise to the populists. But if we come out of our circles, we join the local political parties, we, we have our say in the local meetings, and we help them shape their policies through our local politicians, definitely the world is going to change in our favor and not in the favor of the populace. Thank you. Very good. <coughs> yeah, it, uh, it's just an extended question or comment as well, uh, what he's saying that uh, it is uh, what uh, Helen has already uh, told us that uh, about uh, mirroring. So here, uh, what I have seen, and it is it is quite because I'm not here for a long time. Just uh, I'm living here in, uh, since uh, uh, four years. So uh, that uh, especially in Netherlands, uh, these migrants and majority migrants, two two majority migrant. Uh, uh, groups, uh, Turkish and Moroccans and other, they are, they are also included. They have uh, created either in uh, to respond or to react uh, the populism or nationalism or discrimination or whatever you say it, uh, nativism. Uh, they have uh, created and established two political parties, Nida against Islamophobia, uh, or countering Islamophobia, and then Deng countering uh, discrimination otherwise. And uh, now what I have uh, seen among Pakistani diaspora, they are more inclined towards these parties, rather most of the uh, uh, political activists, they, they have been contesting elections on different level on these platforms. Do you think in, you know, the demographic and, uh, uh, yeah, other kind of, uh, 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 you know, level, if we see, is it the right answer to these things to cope uh, with this, uh, this monster or otherwise? Um, I, don't, I don't have an answer again. <laughs> I think academics generally shouldn't look to them for answers. <laughs> Because they don't know what they're doing themselves sometimes. In fact, most of the time. And as you get older, you realize you know less and less. Eh? Um, so I would say that it was partly because of the parties not including uh, minority groups on their lists in the first place that these new parties were created. So what maybe these new parties are is a kind of knock of entry. It's people wanting into politics who've been excluded. So I do not blame anyone for setting up their own party, whether it's Islamic or anti-Islamic or for animals or for trees or anything. Because if you haven't had those issues on the agenda, you want them on the agenda, right? You want to get your issues into politics so that instead of all they're talking about you as migrants, you're actually talking as migrants or as Dutch citizens. And you don't want to always be the last on the list. Which, which is what's happened to women, it's happened to minorities, it's happened to lots and lots of different categories of people. So I, I hope those parties kind of like are a way in to, to power, to the mainstream. And then maybe you can do alliances with other parties. That's what Dutch politics is all about. It's all about alliances. So there's no reason why you can't collaborate in a, in a parliament, even if you're only three or four, because y y somebody may need you. I hope it's not builders, because they, you won't be able to work with him. But um, you can work with PVDA, you can work with Day 66, you can work maybe up to and not including VVD. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But I'm sure that small parties have a role. And if, the, if it was a one majority system, you wouldn't have these small parties. If it was the UK, mm -hmm. it wouldn't make sense. But here it makes sense. Or the US. Or yeah. the US. Yeah. Yeah. Anila? Uh, I, I just want to say, like, civic engagement and political engagement is a key answer today's situation. 
and these all local parties, though they uh, come up with some kind of identity crisis actually, they don't feel belong here and too, they are too much stranger from their own uh, home countries. But they really want to say something and they are becoming like some kind of reaction because they feel left. And they really want to feel representative, they really want to feel included in all the decision making and this, this is the system. But as Helen said, we need, really need to be careful what kind of message they are delivering, are they are inclusive, or again they are repeating the old populist idea we are fighting for. So we have to be more careful. Uh, just, just to add just a couple of sentences, I think the situation is also changing there. Uh, you're, you're right that uh, anybody has, uh, if, if a group of people thinks that they are not being heard and their issues are not being dealt with by the, or, or taken up by the mainstream political parties, they have the right to start their own movement, and this is how movements start. But I think with, with evolution of new and coming of new generations, if you think now, looking at European elections, the, the Spitzenkandidat, the, the top candidate in the European Union elections of Fefede, is a, I think is a Turk gentleman. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you see a lot of those people coming in the mainstream politics now. Uh, not Pakistanis don't have that inclination too much. Yeah. But you see Moroccans, uh, you see the mayors uh, yeah. of, uh, of Arnhem yeah. and of Rotterdam and so on and so forth. So you see those people coming through the mainstream political parties and some don't feel represented that they, they think they have still, I mean if you talk particularly about Denk, they think they have to represent Erdogan here. Just, just, I'm making an extremist statement. So be it. I mean, let them do it. So that's that's uh, that's okay. One more question, then we would like to wind it up. Anyone else who wants to say something or wants to ask a question? Or if not, we would like to request. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, without Mike, I, I would like to shortly say that it is our responsibility to reach out to our own people first to make sure that things are. Uh, positive on our end, then they will be good on the other end. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. But the question remains: How do we create interest in them? Uh, that is a very big challenge we face every day. Because uh, even uh, coming, uh, building up to this event, uh, you talk to many people through Facebook, through so the rest of the social media, and if you analyze the kind of uh, subjects they are involved in, and they they discuss on daily basis. Okay, that's the nature of the medium as well. It is a fun medium. It's a medium to communicate all kinds of things. And we maybe we take it too seriously that only political serious things should be debated. No. People say funny things and jokes and recipes, uh, uh, do all kinds of socialist stuff on it. But nevertheless, I think there is very little uh, political, social, or serious discussions on them. And we have to see how we can stimulate those uh, further like to ask Asma to give a summary to, to wind it up. <coughs> thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the speakers for their very informative insights into the phenomenon of populism. And I think a lot has been discussed. I wrote like a recap, and then I was like, most of this has already been discussed. Um, uh, the phenomenon itself, its causes, and what we as um, migrants uh, can do at our own end um, to counter it or to challenge uh, this onslaught of populism. Uh, but I'd still like to recap the whole discussion. And um, as already mentioned, immigrants have been a part of um, uh, Europe uh, for decades, if not more, and in the Netherlands, especially this uh, changing nature uh, uh, of the Olive Throne and from uh, guest workers uh, to this new generation which was born and raised in the Netherlands. Um, which is struggling between the values of their parents and still claiming Europe as their own, just as much as it, just as much as it belongs to the natives. Now I'll use that word. Or uh, um, that created a new uh, dynamic, and uh, it was a their parents' culture was far removed, or apparently far removed from the ethos of European society. But it was trying to claim Europe as its own, and this underlying tension combined with amongst many other factors, the economic recession of 2008, um, gave a boost to the populist narrative, um, where uh, there was this attempt uh, to find someone to blame. Um, and so the foreigner was the, uh, the, foreigner was, was the um, most obvious um, target. 
Um, also, the recent wave of immigration from conflict-ridden areas like Syria, Afghanistan, it only um, gave it a further boost. Um, sometimes to the extent that traditionally center-right parties also had a visible shift to the right just because they wanted to compete with the right for a share of the, of the populist uh, narrative and uh, leading to um, the more, uh, what would seemingly be more expected uh, uh, shift in policies towards refugees, immigrants, uh, tighter scrutiny of asylum seekers, limiting their stay, but also, uh, and this could just be my opinion, but also to more dramatic measures like stripping um, ISIS recruits, uh, which have uh, mostly been from second generation uh, immigrants, stripping them of their uh, nationalities, even uh, 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 abandoning their European citizen children in war-torn um, uh, regions in refugee camps. Um, while establishing this, however, and this has already been discussed to great lengths already here, um, uh, we also need to recognize that some responsibility rests on the migrant population. Um, this can be uh, uh, second generation migrants, also refugees who are coming here for security, skilled or non-skilled people coming here for better economic opportunities, and um, uh, skilled migrants whose usefulness sometimes uh, protects them from uh, the, the, the populist diatribe uh, can be very uh, uh, handy in, in trying to bridge this gap between uh, these two worldviews and uh, in order to find um, a common ground uh, and contribute uh, uh, jointly towards the progress of these societies. And there, of course, um, at a very local level, like uh, Helen, uh, Dr. Helen pointed out, common gardens or wherever people can work together, come together and work together. Um, it could also be uh, because human uh, individual interaction humanizes the other. And more such opportunities should be sought out by the immigrants themselves. Uh, it could be shared neighborhoods. It could be uh, participating in each other's festivities or even a very simple use of the Dutch language in mosques. Uh, so very simple little small things on our own end. Um, and I do realize that we do when we talk about these small measures, maybe we're oversimplifying uh, this very complicated, uh, multifaceted challenges of populism, but, but still um, I think it's worthwhile uh, for migrants to introspect, to recognize, and to address uh, some of the resistance from within their own <coughs> communities towards integration. And this could probably be one of the, if not the most effective ways of, of challenging um, the narrative that the populists uh, uh, propagate. Um, so that's it for me. I hope I've been able to uh, wrap up uh, 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 the whole discussion that we had here. Uh, but again, I, I would like to thank all of you for your participation and especially the two speakers. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you for coming and indeed a very enlightening and good discussion, lively discussion. Uh, before we leave, we can still stay here and have yeah. a, a small discussion as we always have, like after party. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, here is a, a small box. If anyone wants to drop a few cents in it, please, uh, please do. It helps us to cover some of the expenses of these events. So that would be fantastic if you can Next contribute Next something. Evenings. Next, you want? No, 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 no just, just yeah. Uh, yeah um, actually, we have missed one event. Uh, it was about, about transgenders. Mm -hmm. So it uh, because there was there was some uh, you can say uh, disciplinary or ma management issues that uh, that uh, actually uh, force us to uh, not to hold that event. But uh, in the next, uh, our next event would be the same event, uh, but uh, with the broader uh, participation from different communities, not only from Pakistan. So the, it, it is, it is very, uh, it was and it is still an issue that uh, we want to discuss. Uh, so uh, just, just, just to. Uh, announce it or inform you that the next event would be about uh, transgenders. Yeah? Do you know what the date? Uh, no, uh, we uh, we would announce soon. Obviously, <coughs> uh, you are all uh, in touch uh, because, yeah, I think uh, very soon.
Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.